to the Fantasy Footballers DFS Podcast with your hosts, Kyle Borgannoni and Matthew Betts. Welcome in once again to the Fantasy Footballers DFS Podcast. We have a post-honeymoon edition of our show this week. Matt, how was getting married, man? Dude, what a day. Um, honestly, like the weather was perfect. All things considered, given the COVID pandemic, everything went as smooth as it could have. Uh, man, my wife is amazing uh, for all the sacrifices she makes to do this kind of stuff. So it was good to get away, unplug a little bit. But man, uh, I was listening to the show while I was gone, of course, <laughs> and and really kind of itching to get back into fantasy football because it's prime draft season and we've got best ball going on and DFS is right around the corner. So, man, I'm super excited to be back, but it was great to get away for a little bit. Yeah, you have the ring to prove it. So uh, you didn't just ghost us for a couple of weeks just to get off on a vacation. Um, but maybe maybe we're going to find out you have some different takes, you know, post being married to that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you don't care about the Eagles anymore. Maybe. Oh, no, I, sir. <laughs> that will never change. Maybe, maybe you won't trash my Falcons on this episode. <laughs> well, we'll see about that. You might have a chance at that one. But man, um, I want to attack that defense in DFS this year. So I think we're going to be talking about it quite a bit <laughs> as the season goes. Well, yeah, if it's your first time listening to us, this is DFS for the rest of us. Um, I'm the editor for the Fantasy Footballers. Matt is an uh, injury expert for us. And so we kind of get to bring a, pers- a unique perspective together uh, from the Fantasy Footballers world. And if you want to go online, you can follow our accounts. I'm at Kyle underscore Borg. And Matt's at the Fantasy PT. And what would really mean a lot to us, if you like this show, if you are committed to the fantasy footballers just to go on iTunes, subscribe and review. And over the next month leading up to real football, we are going to be unpacking a little bit more about DFS. And the reason why we call it DFS for the rest of us is for a lot of people, DFS and that circle of fantasy football can be a bit intimidating. And so one of the things we want to do is break it down. We're going to have an upcoming 101 episode where we just kind of break down. This is how you approach DFS. You have to think differently than season long or dynasty. We're going to give you some tools and ways that we research each week and some tips and tricks that we really like. And I think that's super important. What about for you when you first got into DFS? What was that process like for you, Matt? Yeah, when I first got into it, I was just a really like casual player, didn't really know a lot of stuff, didn't read a ton of content, didn't listen to podcasts. And now I, I feel way more informed. And I honestly feel like it's because I refined my process. You and I were actually talking last night a little bit about this. And really, for me, what it comes down to is like kind of having a set system and, and set schedule throughout the week where, you know, you start to open up, you look at pricing, then you kind of go through players that you know you like for the week, and then do they fit the pricing and to fit your budget? So it's just fascinating, the, the the strategy behind it, for sure. It's a whole different animal. So I'm really excited to bring our listeners um, a different perspective, maybe than what they're used to for DFS. So yeah, man, it's, it's going to be a blast this season. And if you're a listener of this podcast, I want to make sure that you know, know about our promo code right now. You can enter DFS pod on the fantasy footballers website to get the DFS pass, something that Matt and I will be contributing to weekly. You'll get a little discount, but right now, if you order the DFS pass, it's $59.99, which is what it will be in season. You also get the ultimate draft kit for free. So you're basically getting $30 worth of free stuff, but not just, this isn't just the throw in we're, we're giving you an award winning tool. The ultimate draft kit honestly is something that. I use throughout the year. It's something that right now I check my app almost every single day because there's constantly updating. If you buy a magazine, it's out of date the moment that it's printed. And so the great thing about the UDK is it's refreshed every single day. So when we found out that Lamar Miller was signed by the Patriots, you can adjust and find out the Patriots backfield, even though he did get placed on the NFI list today uh, when they signed him. Um, so that sounds, that's kind of weird, but yeah, go online, DFS pass, uh, UDK, you can get that combo and use the promo code DFS pod. That would really uh, mean a lot to us knowing that you're listening and you actually think this is going to be a product worth looking at. But I want to start us off with a quick question. Last week, we talked about best ball strategy and pivots. Essentially, what is the best way to look at best ball? How do you construct your roster? And we play on underdog fantasy which is an awesome website we'll refer to more and more later. But for best ball tournaments, some tournaments are structured in a way where weeks 14, 15, and 16 kind of play as a tournament. 
So you're actually looking at those three weeks as if it's uh, the playoffs in a redraft or dynasty league. And so it's really important to stack your teams and to see who's going to just go above and beyond those final three weeks. So is there a team that you like that you would like to stack based on their schedule for weeks 14, 15, and 16? Yeah, I like the Saints schedule quite a bit in those weeks. Um, And when you're looking at these matchups, of course, it's a little dangerous to kind of project what a defense might look like in those uh, those later weeks because it changes just year to year so much. But I look at those teams that they're playing and, and this is the schedule week 14. They're at Philly week 15. They play the Chiefs and then week 16. They play the Vikings. The nice thing about those matchups is those defenses don't really scare you too much. You kind of mentioned I'm an Eagles fan at the top of the show. Um, I'll believe they have a good defense and a good secondary when I see it, but all three of those offenses are good. And so I know the Saints in those matches are probably going to have a high over under in terms of, of win total. And uh, I'm sorry, not win total, but uh, point total on the game. So it, uh, points are going to be plentiful. There's going to be a lot of offense in those games. I'm going to target the Saints for that specific type of reason um, in a, a best ball tournament such as underdog fantasy. Yeah, and I'll touch on the Saints a little bit more later when we talk about some of our best ball values, but I think they're a great pick. You know, there's so many different ways to to look at them. Obviously, there's Kamara and there's Thomas at the beginning, but Breeze comes in pretty cheap, Emmanuel Sanders, Jared Cook. Yeah, there's there's some unique ways uh, to get the Saints on a roster. I'll, I'll go with the Bucks. I've mostly been off in terms of when I see a team that's hyped as much as they've been this offseason, when you have to start an offense in a new way. I really do trust Bruce Arians and it's hard to bet against Tom Brady, but the the Bucks, there's just a lot that has to gel and go right. And you have to bank on, but if you look at their schedule week 14, they play those Vikings, like you said, and the Vikings defense is not what it used to be. Uh, it's just a different squad. They've turned over so many of their veterans week 15. They play at my Falcons in Atlanta and we're a joke. Uh, on defense and usually when we play the bucks uh at least you're honest high scoring (laughs) yeah the bucks last year i I checked out this set the bucks in 12 of their 16 games they hit the their games hit the over and obviously they had Jameis winston who just basically said i'll throw 30 picks and it'll be fine i guess when you throw 5,000 yards that's pretty cool uh but week 16, they also play at the Lions. So I think the Bucks would be a great team to stack, especially if you're getting some values on some guys. I, I'd be interested if you got one of the running backs and you paired him with Brady. So if, if you got Keyshawn Vaughn or Rojo, I also wouldn't hate OJ Howard as your third tight end because he's just being left for dead. And if they're going to run 12 personnel, he's going to be out on the field. Brady knows how to use his tight end. So I like the Bucks, And I'll give one more team that... Uh, is kind of my alt for this and that's the Ravens. And it's kind of unfair because some of them are priced up, but week 14, they play at Cleveland week 15 is against Jacksonville and week 16 is against the giants. And the reason why we care so much about stacking in best ball is you want to exponentially be able to beat your opponents. Like it's not just, you know, I want to get one of the top scores. Like you want to be able to far surpass them. And so when you start stacking players together, Lamar Jackson, Marquise Brown, players like that, maybe you get JK Dobbins in there as well. Then you're, you're basically setting yourself up. If that team goes bonanza that week, you can go way above your opponent. So those are some picks I like. And for the main segment today, I wanted us to get into some best ball ranks and kind of compare them to the fantasy footballers. So let's get into some best ball. Best Ball Bonanza. So let's talk about comparing rankings. There's so many different rankings out there on the internet. I mean, on Twitter, you can see so many people say, I want this guy as a wide receiver. I think he's a wide receiver one, when in reality, there's only 12 guys that can finish up there. But it's important to kind of compare rankings and cross sites to kind of find where there's values or where people are being overvalued. And that's something that you've gotten to do recently. You compared some of the footballers' rankings to a certain ADP. Why is that an exercise that you think is valuable? Yeah, for me, it's, it's really all about kind of understanding what ADP tells you and what rankings tell you. And so what I mean by that is when you look at your, if you're in your draft, whether it's best ball or even a redraft league, and you're, you're seeing these ADPs because each app that you play in or online, if you're on you know Yahoo or ESPN or Underdog or whatever it is, it tells you players ADP. And, and sometimes you don't have to draft a player 
at their ranking to get a player above ADP. And what I mean by that is we're going to talk about those guys. You can understand, okay, I really like, you know, insert the name, player X here. I'm going to I'm going to shoot for him. I'm going to get him on my team. Well, if he's ranked as a wide receiver two, but you believe he has wide receiver one upside and he's going later than his ranking for most most sites, you don't necessarily have to go up and get him at his ranking. You can kind of wait and get him at his ADP or even just go a little bit above to, to target those players aggressively. So really, I just love taking advantage of ADP because, man, I don't know about you, but you scroll through these apps and you're just like, what? is happening <laughs> like how are these players falling so far so adp to me is really just a, a way to gauge um rankings and then kind of compare it to where they're going in drafts yeah and you can call us homers all day <laughs> working for the footballers but i mean in terms of the industry you know routinely have multiple people within the top 20 footballers know what they're doing on rankings you know we're mostly known for just kind of being the fun goofy group but they really do well in terms of ranks and in terms of comparing that to other lists. And this is one of the few tips I will give people with best ball. I never, ever draft from top 200 lists. It just doesn't make sense to kind of look at this one linear thing. We usually talk about drafting in tiers. And tiers still does make a lot of sense in terms of drafting. But when you look at the discrepancy in terms of the ballers consensus ranking and best ball ADP, you're going to see a wide margin, especially of players that you're just not going to be able to get. I mean, there's certain players that are that are ranked on websites. You know, if you're playing on Underdog, you're gonna look at at some of those rankings and see like I, there's just no way. I've never, for instance, I have yet to get Mike Evans in any single draft because right now he's the 303. Uh, we're fantasy footballers right now. Have him a little bit later, and I would agree with them. I think Mike Evans is more of a middle of the road wide receiver two, and he's being drafted like he's a wide receiver one. And so you just have to see those discrepancies so that when you're drafting. You, you can make a note and say, you know what, I'm not going to be able to get this guy. So I wanted to get into a couple of different names. And this is one that I know that you and I are going to agree on. But we are going to disagree on some of these. So I want us to, to bring out the, the boxing gloves in a second. If you're your wife's down. okay with that. <laughs> you're going down, man. <laughs> I wanted to bring up a player that right now the footballers have, Mike and, and Jason have him as the highest in the entire industry. I checked out the rankings earlier on Fantasy Pros. Right now, DJ Chark is the Ballers consensus wide receiver 15. Mike has him all the way up at wide receiver 11. There's no one else that has him higher. Jason has at wide receiver 12. In best ball, he's going as the wide receiver 20. And if you compare in terms of overall, he's going 53rd overall. So, DJ Chark is routinely going in the middle fifth round. And so right now, if you construct your draft the right way, you can get him as your wide receiver one or wide receiver two while you've already hammered running backs earlier. And the reason why I like Chark is because we've already seen him do it. We saw him last year, weeks one through 11. He was the wide receiver five and he did it with Gardner. He did it with Gardner Minshew, who was more than respectable as a quarterback and as a fantasy quarterback he actually had some brilliant moments uh, in terms of play action passes and deep passes. That was something that Gardner was at the top of the league at. He had the third highest passer rating on play action passes. He was best on deep balls in the league. It's just the fact that the Jaguars didn't take advantage of this. Gardner only used play action 13.6% of the time, which was lowest among qualifying quarterbacks. So if they get smart and we assume that coaching and the coaches can be rational, then I love DJ Chark's outlook. I love his upside. Um, and you're not paying up for him. You know, you're not paying up for like Allen Robinson when he was a Jaguar. He came off that monster season where he had 14 touchdowns, 1400 yards. And the next year he was a first round draft pick. You know, you're getting DJ Chark way, 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 way down the road in a way where you can really hammer away the first three or four rounds and then set yourself up. So my first question to you is, do you think he's a wide receiver one or is he a little bit lower for you? I have him just outside that range, but you know, certainly if he finished inside the top 12, I would not be shocked. And I know the ballers would not be shocked with this ranking. Clearly, um, it's definitely within the range of outcomes and the price to pay for that potential upside and, and range of outcome is pretty cheap. So yeah, if you're starting RBRB or even three RBs, and then you're getting DJ Chark as your wide receiver one or two. Um, yes, please. Let me, let me compare a couple of players that are going around DJ Chark and maybe who would you rather have? And, and granted, we know DJ Chark is, is a value here, but 
Would you rather draft DJ Chark or AJ Brown? DJ Chark. DJ Chark or Adam Thielen? I would lean Thielen with that one. Okay. Let me give you a couple more. DJ Chark or DK Metcalf? DJ Chark. They're going back I'm to still, back I'm, in drafts right I, now. I, I'm still Tyler Lockett is the one, one on that team for 2020. That's that's where I'm at with that. So I would take him over DK and I would take DJ Chark over DK as well. And then I'll give you one more. I feel like this name has come up a lot. DJ Chark or Calvin Ridley? Oh, that to me is like so, <laughs> so close. Flip a coin, honestly. I think I have Chark one spot above uh, Calvin Ridley in my ranks, but honestly, love both. Yeah, I love when you get to ask these kind of questions. Uh, same thing on the footballers. That in the show doc, I kind of set up players sometimes. And whenever you get that pause and you kind of get that that kind of squirm, <laughs> Uh, that's one of my favorite things to listen as, as I'm going through the show. Yeah, I feel like DJ Chark, if you can say he's around the wide receiver 15, you're going to get him on your team. And that's really what you need to do in best balls. You need to say, if you like a player and you think that there's upside also built into his price, then go after him and maybe, you know, jump 10 or so picks in, ahead of people and you can get him. So I love DJ Chark as a value. I have him on a ton of my teams. I have him on my Scott Fishbowl team. I just I think you're you're set up really well if if you get him as your wide receiver too. Yeah, I love it, man. I, I'm gonna keep it going with like the same exact type of analysis. A player, a wide receiver that's undervalued, and I don't understand how he's being drafted at his absolute floor, which you love in best ball. You love those players that have that combination of ceiling and floor. That is Mr. Robert woods of the la rams he is currently the the wide receiver 10 in the ballers ranks he's going as the wide receiver 18 in best ball drafts and like i said i truly believe that that is his floor um outside of injury how can it get worse i mean you look at what he did last year 140 targets and 90 receptions both eighth most in the nfl then you look at what he did as far as his yards after catch second most in the nfl uh over 1100 yards receiving 14th in the nfl in, in that ranking where did he fall off and where did he kind of let us down in fantasy? The touchdowns. Only three total touchdowns last year, 59th in the NFL. And with that volume, which we're projecting to kind of stay the same this year, especially without Brandon Cooks, how does he not find the end zone more? I think six to eight is in the range of uh, range of outcomes for Robert Woods. And like I said, at 18, yeah, you're getting him at his floor. So I'm, I'm pairing Robert Woods and I'm pairing him with DJ Chark as my wide receiver one and two quite often especially on underdog i think it works out really well if you go running back early so these two players man love them both oh man bob woods is also on that scott fishbowl team i got him as my third wide receiver i i third. love the pick yeah he's my third how the heck did you do that well i started i started kind of dangerously because uh i went with michael thomas which i know you have i think on your scott fishbowl team but i do yep. thomas thomas shark and woods oh Dude, that's perfect. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, I'm feel and, and don't even let me start talking about Marvin Jones. But uh, oh. <laughs> I <laughs> do love. Reference. <laughs> I do love Bob Woods, and I did an article earlier where I talked about who could be 2020's Chris Godwin, and I kind of went through a couple different criteria. I said, you need a wide receiver that's outside of the top three rounds, like Godwin was. You need a wide receiver that's the perceived uh, wide receiver two on his own team, and seems like Cooper Cup is the perceived one. You need someone with the potential for loads of targets, and that's what's going to get there. And you need a chance for a quarterback willing just to just go full DGAF, just saying, I'm going to go for it. And if you look at Goff, he was tied for legally in passing attempts. And I loved Woods because he was a yak master, just like Godwin. I mean, that's where Godwin led the league in yards after the catch. Wood was second, as you mentioned. So yeah, I think he's a great value. Why do you think people keep disrespecting him, especially a guy that always outperforms his ADP. Is it just his looks? Is it his name? Why does no one like Robert Woods? Uh, I don't know the specific answer to this question, but my theory is, is it that his family, did he do something wrong? I don't know, man. I, I feel like it's kind of one of those things. And when we see this often in drafts, not just best ball, you see this where people kind of get, just get, tired of the same old thing that they know what it is kind of thing like for years julian edelman was going later than he should have right like oh he's been around for eight years like okay we know the story but we're not sure what dk metcalf could be and we're not sure what aj brown could be so let's find out kind of thing meanwhile you're passing on these guys 
that are just so steady in your lineup. And like we talked about on the last show, go check it out. How important a floor is as well in best ball. Everyone just always wants ceiling, but you need both. And and Robert Woods, he's a floor play mixed with the ceiling play. So yeah, I don't really get it to be honest. Yeah, I, I think he's you're setting yourself up really well, like we said earlier. Hitting running backs at the beginning of your draft is what is most key. You you want to start yourself off, especially in the first round. If you can nab a high end running back and then you come back in the second and third round with either one of those top tight ends or another running back, you're affording yourself the opportunity to get some of these wide receivers like Woods, like Chark. And with best ball, we talked about it last time, but in roster construction, when you're thinking about who you're adding to your team, you need a good seven or eight wide receivers. So it's really tempting to take a Julio, which Julio is my favorite player in the NFL. So I don't even want to disrespect the man, but it's tempting to, to load up on wide receivers. And then you start looking at the fourth or fifth round. And you're like, I need to take a running back when you're going to have to get a ton of wide receivers. You just want enough volume of them so that they can hit in a given week because they're such a volatile position. So, Speaking of wide receiver, we're going to talk about Marvin. No, we won't talk about Marvin Jones again. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Gonna, this is not on the show, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> what if I just change the whole thing and we make it about Marv? Oh, Marv. One of these I just, days, I mean, man. The name is what makes him so compelling and the Home Alone reference. I just I love oh, the fact yes. that his name is Marv. Marv. <laughs> That's a pro reference right there. <laughs> so I'm going to go with uh, a tight end. Uh, I'm going to talk about Jared Cook of the New Orleans Saints right now footballers rankings he's the tight end six which is pretty rich for my blood mike has him down at tight end 10 which is where best ball adp is he's going in the ninth round in in most drafts and every single time that jared cook is in my queue i feel like i'm pausing because when i look at his stats last year 43 catches for 705 yards which is totally fine and nine touchdowns but he did it on 65 targets that means that when we look at it, 21% of his catches were touchdowns. And I just don't think that is repeatable. I do think Drew Brees is kind of an outlier type of quarterback where you can get those type of seasons. But I think we just saw it. And I don't want to chase last year with Jared Cook uh, with the TD rate. He averaged only 4.6 targets per game. The only thing I will say is because Jared Cook is sticking around, if you punted tight end, if you've missed out on the early guys and you're going to have to get three guys anyway... I don't mind pairing Jared Cook with Drew Brees if you're going to form a stack. We mentioned that earlier uh, on our quick question. The Saints have a great schedule at the end of the year. And Brees is actually pretty affordable. In Baller's ranks, he's the QB6, but in best ball, he's going as QB10 and 94th overall. So conceivably, you could take Drew Brees you know, in the eighth round and then maybe two rounds later get Jared Cook. And so you've got that Saints stack. And even better if you got... Kamara or Thomas earlier, you're able to kind of double up. So I don't mind Cook, but with that caveat of pairing him with Breeze, standing alone, I don't want him as my tight end one. How do you feel about his prospects of just being a, I mean, if he's a top 12 tight end, does that really help you? Yeah, the the tight end like six to 12 is the same player a lot of times. And what I mean by that is the the differentiating fantasy points between those finishers year after year after year is just so, so much less than like the wide receiver six to 12 or whatever it is. So really, it's it's all one big group. So for me, when I look at tight end in best ball, um, I'm either going with a stud early like a Kittle or a Kelsey, who, by the way, just got paid (laughs) Or I'm kind of just punting and taking three later. And the only time I've ever seen myself this year taking Jerry Cook is when I already have Drew Brees. So, yeah, and for the stack, like we talked about earlier. So I'm kind of with you, man. Yeah, 21% of his receptions are as touchdowns. I mean, that's literally more than one out of every five. I don't know how repeatable that is. Um, But certainly we like the offense and you want to have a piece of that. So if I have Brees, I'm okay with it. Outside of that, yeah, I'm passing on Cook this year. Yeah, if you're playing a lot of best ball, like, meaning 20, 30, upwards of 50 different drafts, then yeah, Jared Cook needs to be somebody that you're looking at as part of your strategy. But for the casual player that's learning best ball and that's learning how to do this, tight end is one of those things, like we said in the last episode, you're starting early or you're completely punting. It's those middle round tight ends that really aren't 
that great of value. So who's your next guy? I, I'm sure this guy's got nothing you really want to talk about. You barely like him. We should just move on. Oh, man. How much time do we have to talk about Terry McLaurin? Because <laughs> I'm willing to spend at least a half hour on this. No, um, Terry McLaurin is my my early candidate. We talk, we write up an article every year. The guys do an episode about it for my guys. And we were talking about this earlier as well. Like, I, I'm so in on Terry McLaurin and I don't understand how he's going as a borderline wide receiver two slash three. He's going at the 24, uh, 24th wide receiver, 59th overall. And in the ballers ranks, Jason and Mike are just two very smart men. Andy at 37, I don't understand, uh, brings the, the consensus rank all the way down to 28. If you're getting Terry McLaurin as your wide receiver three, absolutely smash the draft button every single time. I mean, you see what he did last year. Uh, you look at what Pro Football Focus does. They grade players every year. Here's the list of, of players that finished better than Terry McLaurin last year. Michael Thomas, Chris Heard Godwin, Julio Jones, all very good players. Tyreek Hill, DeAndre Hopkins. That is the end of the list. Okay, uh, they can play, I guess. Like they, they can play. Um, the other thing I like about this uh, this value, and I feel like it's kind of a stigma in fantasy. Terry McLaurin came out and he had 919 receiving yards last year, 12th most by any rookie in the last decade. But he didn't get to that 1,000 yard mark. And I feel like when people talk about fantasy, they yeah, they'll say, oh, well, he was still a thousand yard wide receiver. I truly feel that if, if McLaurin had gotten to that 1000 yard mark, we'd be talking about him as like the wide receiver 18, 19 in rankings. Uh, and clearly he's going later. So for me, um, love, love, love Terry McLaurin this year. I'm all in. Yeah, I just think in that offense, there's not really anyone else. I mean, who else are you throwing to at tight end? I mean, can most people name any Washington tight end like Logan Thomas, Jeremy Sprinkle? I mean, these guys are not going to really be difference makers. Uh, you have Trey Quinn, Steven Sims, a couple of rookies. I, there's just no one that's going to be competing for targets. And I know one of your biggest arguments is he could legitimately get a 30% target share. And each year you're maybe seeing two or three guys that even get close to that. Maybe it's Hopkins Julio, Michael Thomas, like I mean, it's really hard to get 30% of an entire offense's uh, targets. And to get that it, 59th overall, you're stealing. And so maybe we need to have an intervention with Andy. Maybe there's something that he's not telling us because it, it's showing right now in how he's ranking your boy. Yeah, I, I think Andy knows something we don't. <laughs> Otherwise, um, we'll have a talk. Mr. Holloway. <laughs> maybe he just doesn't think, maybe they're like a creative team because, you know, it still says Washington football team. So maybe he yep. thinks it's like a Madden team that you haven't really finished fully developing who they are, <laughs> what, they're, what they're about. Maybe. Can, can you poke any holes in that argument though? Like, is there any downside to McLaurin in your eyes? Yeah, I, I just think of one, we think of bad teams and immediately we think, oh, well, you know, they're just going to be throwing the whole time. Sometimes bad teams are just really, really bad. I mean, in such a way where there's not really production there. Like we've seen it, the Steelers last year, a team that was ripe with talent, you know, pass catchers, like it sunk their entire team and players that are as talented as Juju. So it can happen if Dwayne Haskins really isn't the answer, which maybe Alex Smith needs to be the answer just because he's a superhuman for staying alive. Incredible, man. I, I think for me, it's just the team. It's not the talent. He gets open. Reception perception has showed us that as well in the ultimate draft kit. Like Terry McLaurin is an elite player and he can move into that next level of kind of the Odell Beckham, the shorter receivers that just Stefan Diggs, like players that just know how to get open. And I remember I, I loved him coming out of college. I, I got him in a dynasty league and I got him last year in Scott Fishbowl because he had chops uh, as a returner. And there's something that translates from the college game to the pros. If you can show that you're really good on special teams, it somehow just translates to just being someone that's just freaking fast. And <laughs> I, I like that about him. So I love him where he's at. I will totally draft him there, but it's not bulletproof. And the biggest thing also is at some point, there are about 20 better receivers than everyone else. You know, you, And not everybody can be inside that top 20. And so when you start stacking names, you have to ask yourself, like, do I like Terry McLaurin or I'll give you another name, uh, Cortland Sutton. Uh, Terry McLaurin. Terry McLaurin or Keenan Allen. 
I'm nervous about Keenan this year, man. Give me Terry McLaurin. All right, let me give you a couple more. These all of these guys are going ahead of Terry McLaurin. Terry McLaurin or AJ Brown. That is so close. I think I think McLaurin has more consistency. I think Brown gives you way more upside on a weekly basis, but I think overall I'd still lean McLaurin for the safety. No, I think that's about right. So are you saying that you like McLaurin maybe as a, a middle of the road wide receiver too, like kind of in that 19 to 20 something range? Yeah, I've got him at 18 in my ranks. So it's not like I'm Ooh, saying like, hot. oh my gosh, like get him at top 10. Like I'm not saying that by any means, but yeah, I, I think he's a player that could certainly outperform his ADP and that's what we're talking about today. And these guys are, are just such a good value. Yeah, I'm checking out Terry McLaurin's rankings right now to see, I just want to see how hot uh, wide receiver 18 is that would make you the highest man in the world on Terry McLaurin and you don't that hate can't it, do be you? right <laughs> that cannot be right is that right <laughs> yeah right now uh no wait whoa never mind somebody has him at wide receiver six what <laughs> that, that can't be right <laughs> that, that whoever is, you are that, c- congratulations that is spicy <laughs> <laughs> that is quite spicy. That's for shock and awe only. Uh, I want to give a player that, honestly, I I feel a little nervous bringing up the name for a couple of reasons. One, um, Jonathan Taylor, or we like to call him JTT, Jonathan Taylor Thomas, um, is super talented. A guy that no one will question whether he is ripped or not. I mean, honestly, that's what people are doing on Twitter these days, is if you're an athlete, you want to show how muscular you are and so that you can move up draft rankings. That's really the ploy by some of these players is so that they can be Absolutely. drafted higher. But right now you have to take Jonathan Taylor, a rookie who has never played a down. And recently he was uh, coach Frank Reich said that Marlon Mack would be the starting running back, but he would ride a hot hand right now. You have to take him at the end of the third round. So he's, he's a running back 20, which doesn't sound that egregious, but 36th overall. And that's kind of where drafts are going in 2020 is you're seeing all of these running backs kind of pushed up and you're getting some wide receiver value, which is why we talked about DJ Chark, why we talked about Robert Woods, Terry McLaurin. These are guys that are just depressed in their value because running backs are taking up those spots. And in the ballers consensus ranks, he's the 74th overall. He's the running back 27. So not that crazy in terms of actual running back rankings, but in terms of a a draft you're waiting a good three or four rounds later if you were to draft Taylor and you're just not going to be able to get him. I mean, I'm seeing people draft him as their RB1 if they've went wide receiver, wide receiver. And that makes me a little bit more uh, uncomfortable knowing that Marlon Mack you can get in the ninth round. Now, at the end of the year, I'm I'm pretty sure Jonathan Taylor is going to be the guy, super talented, but Naheem Hines is still there. This team had a lot of vacated targets. I know Philip Rivers just loves checking down. That's his thing. I'm just nervous about this price. Where are you at? Yeah, I think in I think it depends on what you're expecting from Jonathan Taylor. Like, and this might be different if you're playing in like more of a smaller type format best ball, like it's just a normal 12 team league. Uh, versus like underdog fantasies, like huge um, one million dollar tournament. Like if you want to take a shot on Jonathan Taylor and try to win a million bucks, be my guest. But uh, the statistics show it probably won't work out because, yeah, I mean he's gonna give work away to Marlon Mack early. Uh, we don't know how long he's gonna be uh, in the mix. That's Mack, by the way. And then like you said with Naheem Hines there as well. Like I-, I love Jonathan Taylor. He's a stud running back. And in 2021, I guarantee you he's ranked as a running back one for for people because he's that good and that offensive line is that good. But um, how quickly will that happen? I'm not sure. And like you said, I just think it speaks to it. The 74th overall player in ballers ranks versus 36th overall in ADP just shows you how many wide receivers you have to pass on in the rankings to even see his name. I won't do it. So for me, I don't have a lot of Jonathan Taylor just because that price is is way too much for me. Yeah, I haven't I haven't selected him in one best ball draft. And I was talking to Jason the other day and I thought this was a good point we were, we were talking through. When you think of redraft, in order to get to the playoffs, weeks 14, 15, and 16, like you have to get there. Like your team actually has to make the playoffs. You need to have a winning record through those first 13 weeks. In best ball, those weeks count the exact same. Now, if you're in a tournament, like we said, then then those last three weeks matter a lot. But if you're in a regular best ball league, which is with 12 people, 
then weeks 14, 15, and 16 count just as much as week one. And so a lot of times rookies take a little bit longer to develop. You saw that with AJ Brown last year where, you know, second half of the year, he was like the wide receiver two with Tannehill. So if you have players like that, they can gain a ton of steam towards the end of the year. And so that's why you see, I think his draft part price that high. I mean, like I said, 36 overall is, is, um, incredibly rich for my blood, but he could work out if you're set up in a way where your team can take that hit and your team is actually gaining steam. So let's say you did take Jonathan Taylor. Mm, let's say in the, in that third round, do you think that it's important for you to be able to hit on a couple of other running backs later, knowing at the beginning of the season, you might not get as much production. So like, do you need to hit on a Ronald Jones? Do you need to be able to find running backs? Maybe you got the Lions running back, DeAndre Swift and carry on Johnson, you guessed right. Do you feel like that's the kind of roster that you need to take that hit? I think so. I think if you're drafting Taylor and understanding that you might not get his ceiling early, you need to be able to find other pieces to kind of plug in. And sometimes that's where those floor plays honestly can be helpful. Uh, James White, who we talked about last time, um, guys like that, Tariq Cohen is not sexy in, in fantasy football, but he's going to catch 75 footballs this year and have PPR value or half PPR value. So yeah, again, those floor plays can be helpful for a player like Jonathan Taylor, who has a massive ceiling, but I agree. You you kind of have to hit on those like middle round type guys. Ronald Jones is a great example of DeAndre Swift, either Cam Akers or Daryl Henderson, whichever one you think is, is the guy. Um, yeah, I agree. That's kind of the way this has to work out for you. What do you think about the strategy in best ball if someone takes Jonathan Taylor and then they follow it up with Mac in the ninth round? I actually really like that. And, and a lot of it is team specific. So um, the Colts have the easiest strength of schedule according to Vegas win totals this year. Obviously, the offensive line is amazing. They've got an up and coming defense. And so I suspect there's going to be a lot of games where one of those two guys is in there at the end of the game, just turning down the clock, uh, potentially finding the end zone. And there's actually been some interesting studies done in best ball formats where um, people will look at, okay, how did how did teams do at the end of the season when they took two running backs on the same roster in kind of these ambiguous type of situations? We're not saying take, um, I don't know, uh, Dalvin Cook and Alexander Madison because we know Dalvin Cook's the dude. These types of ambiguous situations, it actually can be kind of beneficial uh, to take both. So at that ADP, I'm fine taking both guys uh, in the Colts backfield. Yeah, you mentioned James White. That's a situation where, you know, you're you're getting players that are costing not that much. You know, James White's a seventh round pick right now. But if you were to pair him and guess right on the other Patriots running back, which it's news to me, if it's... Sonny Michel, is it Rex Burkhead? Is it Damian Harris? Flip a coin. Is it Lamar Miller? <laughs> um, Flip a, a four-sided coin. <laughs> or is it some guy off the street? I mean, it could really could be any anyone. But last year, the Patriots running backs combined for the third most PPR points. And so if you looked at Michel and, and White last year, if you piece them together, then you had a top running back in that position. And so in this instant... I think a lot of people are just assuming Mac's going to eventually give way. Taylor's going to be the guy. It could be the case that they're just back and forth the entire year. They're both valuable and you'd be thankful that you had both of them on your roster. So you just have to bake that in with his price knowing that there is risk. It's not a guarantee he's going to take over, but he certainly has the talent to do it. Yes, sir. All right, let's wrap this up here with the last player we'll talk about. That is... Tyler Higby, who I think is just being overdrafted like crazy right now. He is currently going as the tight end six. He is the tight end eight in ranking. So again, doesn't look like it's that big of a deal, but uh, I, I still struggle to see uh, the value here with Tyler Higby because of, like you said, usually the hit rate on those middle round tight ends isn't awesome. And, and that's where he's going. So I don't love it for the ADP. I don't love it for where you have to take him in drafts. But then also, are we really sure... Gerald Everett isn't going to be a thing this year. I'm not convinced. And I think at his ADP, which that's Gerald Everett, he's tight end 28 off the board, 208th overall. I mean, literally going in the last round of drafts. Um, if they're going to run 12 tight end or 12 tight end, 12 personnel sets that would be uh, with the Rams, the, that the would be Bears insane. <laughs> the Bears would run that. Um, if they're going to run 12 personnel, which is two tight ends on the field, 
then certainly there's going to be weeks where we're let down by Tyler Higby and Gerald Everett comes out of nowhere and has 50 yards and a touchdown. And you're like, oh, man, I started the wrong guy. So in best ball drafts, I find myself often kind of pivoting away from Higby and targeting Gerald Everett as my last pick, especially if I take three tight ends. He's kind of my favorite last round guy because I know he'll be there. And by the way, Tyler Higby, I just want to put this out there before the massive week 13 breakout, which was league winning last year. He only topped 50 yards twice, and he's played 58 career games before that point. So it's a small sample size. I'm willing to kind of fade that uh, based off what we've seen for most of his career to that point. Yeah, Gerald Everett's being buried 208th overall. I have him in a couple dynasty leagues, and he's definitely the tight end that I prefer. You know, in best ball, we talk so much about values that we end up only talking about players that are you know, way suppressed. It almost seems like we don't care at all about anybody that's in the early rounds. It's just that those are where the studs are. You know, the majority of them, you're trying to find the guys towards the end of the draft that you can uh, kind of find the the extra points that are sitting there that are in the 10th, 12th round. Uh, DJ Chark was basically undrafted by everyone last year, but he was a league winner in best ball. So that's, that's why we're talking so much about these later round guys. Uh, they just matter so much. And yeah, I, Everett might be on the field just as much as Higby, and I don't want to bet on Higby and where he's at. So I wanted to compare Higby, where he's going right now, and just kind of the the other players cross positionally. So let's let's say that you're passing on Higby. He's around pick 79, 80 in some drafts right now. Going around him is Jarvis Landry, Jordan Howard, Tariq Cohen couple of quarterbacks, Josh Allen and Matt Ryan, and then Marlon Mack and some guy named Marvin Jones, who I just had to bring up one more time. What do you (laughs) think? I I just listed a bunch of names, but is that what you're doing? You're passing up players that can be your wide receiver three, maybe your running back three. Is that what you're having to do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, At those names, like give me Marvin Jones, definitely give me um, Jarvis Landry, who's always undervalued. Um, I would even potentially take a shot there on a guy like Jordan Howard uh, as a RB3, RB4 type player. Yeah, man. I, and, and you didn't even na- mention the names after him. Brandon Cooks, Deontay Johnson. Yes, please. Uh, sign me up. Yeah, there, there's just so many options. And with tight end, we mentioned it, but those tight ends right there, you're banking on them hitting their value. Like Evan Ingram's right there at tight end six. You know, you're, you're saying, Evan Ingram, you're going to hit this. And I just drafted him somewhere because I, I needed a share of Ingram. I like him as a player. But you're asking those tight ends to kind of return value. And often those middle round guys don't. I'd rather just load up on some of these running backs and wide receivers and fish a little bit later. So let me give you the tight ends that are going after him. Hunter Henry, Hayden Hurst is going after him. Rob Gronkowski, Jared Cook, Austin Hooper. Where does Higby fit in those range for you? Yeah, I think that's all kind of one big tier, to be honest with you. I don't know that he's really elevated above those guys. I could certainly see a scenario where Hunter Henry finishes above him. I could see a scenario where Hayden Hurst comes out with all those vacated targets in Atlanta and finishes ahead of him. If Jared Cook catches a touchdown pass on every 20% of his receptions, he'll finish ahead of him. So, yeah, for me, he's kind of like right in the middle of that tier. Um, But, man, I actually like... The guy's going later just because of the value that you get. I love the, the upside of Mike Kosicki, of a Noah fan, of a Dallas Goddard. So, yeah, I'm just kind of passing that tier in general in best ball formats because of the names we talked about at running back and wide receiver. So we didn't get to get to every single player in values, but in our mailbag each week, we want to hear from you guys. We want to make sure that you feel a part of the show, that you feel ownership of what's going on. So in the same way of fantasy footballer style, Let's get in the mailbag. Mailbag. One day I will scream triumphantly into the mic and yell mailbag. um, And I'll feel good about it. But right now, I don't think I'm there. I can't wait for that day. (laughs) I'll just get Mike to just uh, take over my body for just a second. And uh, his sweet, (laughs) sweet dulcet tones will... Uh, again to play for you guys so here's a couple of questions i wanted to get into and you guys can send those to either of us on twitter or the footballers main account we're going to be sending out more and more dfs style questions coming up especially next week 
where we go over DFS 101. But this first one's from Devin at, De- at D McCarran 225 on Twitter. He asked about pick 12. So if you're at the turn in the first round, at pick 12, if you were going running back, running back, pick two of these running backs. Kenyon Drake, Nick Chubb, Joe Mixon, or Josh Jacobs. So pick two of those guys. Yeah, this is a great spot to pick this year. I, I like either being really early in the first round or at the very end because you could just start with these two stud running backs if that's the approach you want to take. Um, out of these options, for me, it's Kenyon Drake. I, I believe in the scheme and I believe what we saw last year is not really being a fluke. Um, we saw any running back in that offense really succeed. David Johnson was the one, the running back six before he went down with injury. And then we saw Chase Edmonds come in out of nowhere and explode. So I don't, I don't think it matters who's carrying the ball for um, the Cardinals. I, I believe in the scheme, and Kenyon Drake's going to get every opportunity to be the lead dog there. So I like that a lot. And then the second one I'm going to go with, it's, it's kind of a tough decision. I'll lean Joe Mixon, and it's mostly because of the fact that I just think his talent is is insane. And he hasn't really even been used in the past game the way he should be. There's talks of them doing that this year. Obviously, the offensive line we're projecting to be a little bit better. Um, and, and it's tough because I do love Chubb and I do love Jacobs. Honestly, man, you, you can't go wrong. I actually did have a draft recently where I was at pick 12 and Drake was already off the board. So I was staring at those three running backs, Chubb, Mixon, and Jacobs. And I was pretty sure that I wanted to go running back, running back in that spot. And I chose Chubb and I chose Mixon. Um, Chubb mostly because if it's a not, if it's not a PPR format, I feel better about where he is. Dude's talented. He probably should have had the rushing title last year, if not for some unfortunate end of the season, probably should have had more touchdowns. Love Nick Chubb. And then, yeah, Mixon was my choice. That own line is the only thing that concerns me. He's easily a top five talented back. If he gets the passing down work from Joe Burrow, if that's an up-tempo offense, I, I love his prospects. Jacobs, you know, the news just came out with Jacobs saying he wanted to get 60 catches, and I think he could. I also just don't trust John Gruden. I trust him to throw it to Jalen Richard, who they resigned for some reason. I, and and just to make a lot of old school football moves, but Jacobs really could be the workhorse. But give me Chubb and give me Mixon right ahead of them. And I'll, let me let me tell you this roster. So I in a best ball draft, I would start off with Mixon and Chubb, and then at the three four turn, I wanted to go another running back. A lot of people won't like this, but I went Todd Gurley, slipped all the way to the end of the third round, and then I took my first. You're throwing a little shade, a little shade my way today on Twitter. I saw that. <laughs> I love. I see. I don't mind Gurley, if, especially if I'm getting him that late. I'm not scared by some of the some of the little you know beat writers saying ah, he didn't look that good. He'll be fine, I think. I, I hope for my Falcons' sake. And then I took DJ Chark, <laughs> you know our boy. So. Mixon, Chubb, Chark, and Gurley. I felt pretty good about that in the draft to kind of, that's my first kind of core that I'm starting with. And that's what you get to do. If you go running back, running back, you likely can come back and get a wide receiver that can be in that 10 to 15 range. And you're set as long as you're, you know, adding a lot of different other players and you're having just a volume of receivers that can go off any given week. Let's go to Brian K here. He asks, why doesn't Odell Beckham get more respect? Is he still a wide receiver one in your opinion? I don't know why he doesn't get enough respect. I think it's probably kind of like we talked about earlier. Some players just kind of have been around for a while. And yeah, we've seen it, but we also have seen flashes of them just disappointing us. And I think that's really what people are, are coming down to. And I think there is a bounce back coming from Odell. And the, the injury report and the write-up in the Ultimate Draft Kit explains this in a lot more detail, but I am buying in to the health of Odell Beckham this year coming off of his sports hernia surgery. Just anecdotally speaking, I mean, that injury in, in the athletes I treat hurts, and they'll tell you it just it just hurts, man. Like You're doing all the right things, but you're still in so much pain, and it takes usually surgery to fix it. And so I believe him when he said he was in pain from all, like August, literally until December, until he had surgery after the season. So... I'm buying the bounce back from him. I think he's just outside the wide receiver one range this year. I think I've got him at like 13 or 14 in my ranks. But certainly, if he finishes inside the top 12, no one's going to be shocked. Yeah, I, th- I think it's one, it's the games played over the last three years and, and what he's missed. It's 
the fact that you probably drafted him last year and you were upset. I mean, I have him in one of my main leagues. He's one of my keepers. And I stuck with him the entire year. And that 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 wears on you when a player with that type of name you're inserting in your lineup every single week because you don't want to put him on the bench. And I had to do that. To get to the playoffs, I had to bench Odell Beckham. And that was he had painful. to last year. He wasn't he, he wasn't doing anything. Yeah, the dude had 10 bus games. So, you know, he wasn't usable so much of the time. And I do think he's a wide receiver one. I think he's in that 10 to 15 range like I was talking about. And the best part is you don't have to pay for Odo Beckham this year. He's a third round pick. So you're getting someone that you know could finish as a top five guy. He's done it before. His first three years in the league, he was five, four, and three. So he's he's done it before. But now you're able to get him at a deflated price and you're able to get those running backs for before you had to pay up in the first round. So he's not getting respect because sometimes the off the field stuff and, you know, just his sometimes just the way that he plays the game. But in terms of fantasy, we do need to give him respect. And hopefully I think he'll come through this year. I love Odo Beckham um, and I will be drafting him on the teams. I don't mind stacking Browns. Uh, some people are just completely staying away from them because of Steven, Kevin Stefanski, but they're still going to throw the ball f- 540 times. I mean, there's still opportunities for them. He just needs to be more efficient because last year it was ugly. Just even getting to a thousand yards was painful. Literally. It, it really was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go for a couple more. Michael Cranford on Twitter says, I'm new to best ball, which is a great thing to be able to say. I think a lot of times people start best ball and think they know what they're doing. That's completely okay to admit that it's the best place to start from. It says I'm new to best ball. Should I take players like Will Fuller? So I'm assuming what this guy's asking is I've heard that best ball is all about big play players, boom bust guys. So do I need to take players like Will Fuller or just Deshaun Jackson? Is that how you build your roster? The answer to this question simply is yes, but obviously we want to talk about why. Um, you, you need those players that can go off on any given week, uh, especially if you're trying to outpace your opponents like you talked about with stacking. So one of my favorite stacks this year is the Deshaun Watson, Will Fuller type of stack because if it hits, I mean, it's going to be massive this year and you can get Will Fuller uh, at a pretty decent value given the injury concerns. But he is a, a fragile type of player in best ball because certainly there's those weeks where either he's not producing or he's injured. And so you should take Will Fuller, but you shouldn't take all types of receivers like Will Fuller. You need some guys like a Jamison Crowder or a Julian Edelman or, or safe, um, reliable options to kind of help balance out your wide receiver core. But yes, your roster should have guys like Will Fuller on it. I wonder what it feels like when you look at your roster and, and just how those guys feel each week where you have like a Will Fuller who's just like, this guy could go for 200 yards. And then you have like Jamison Crowder sitting next to him. It's like, hey, I got my 40 yards and I might have helped you out because next week Fuller is going to not play at all. I feel <laughs> I feel like when you look at your roster, you just look at the the crew, the cast of characters you have on on your roster. It's kind of this mix of of guys that hopefully can get you to the end. And it takes players like Jamison Crowder. It takes the Starling Shepherds of the world that are that are there. Jarvis Landry, like those are the consistent players. If you if you would have chose Landry last year over Beckham, you would have had the Browns wide receiver one, and and that's okay. So yeah, you need those players. You want them on your team, but don't construct your roster only with those guys. Last question. We'll get out of here on this one from Carl D on Twitter. I love this question because it's going to segue into what we're doing the next couple of weeks, but how should I be preparing for week one DFS? What is your research timeline leading up to week one? Well, step one is obviously the DFS pass. Uh, Step two is listening to this podcast. So you're doing it right already. And then step three for getting ready for week one is, is, you know, I would say don't forget about using the season long redraft approach of understanding like what people are saying and and there's tons of content obviously on our site and on the main show about just like teams that we like players that we're targeting all that stuff matters in dfs and in season long but we'll talk a lot more about this next week about how you kind of construct your roster so i would say 
I think people all, all almost always kind of think about it as like DFS prep and redraft prep as two separate things. But for me, when you approach the season in week one, you're kind of, uh, I think, getting ready for the entire season starting in August and then moving forward. So that's kind of how I approach the NFL season in general. Um, and then as far as research timeline, it's still a little too early for me to kind of start specifically for roster building for week one. I have looked at prices, uh, of course, <laughs> I'm very excited. Uh, but that will probably start for me in about two weeks or so as we get closer to the start of the season. Yeah, there's pricing out there for DraftKings and FanDuel. If you want to just you know, peruse the list and just kind of see what's out there. My biggest tip is this. Find your favorite pin. For Jerry Seinfeld, that was a very simple Bic pin for me. I'm going to show you here on the screen. It's the Pilot G205. Oh, that's a good one. It's pretty smooth. It's better than the .38, which is basically a knife ripping open your paper. Seven, thick. <laughs> Ten is a marker. But the Pilot G205. Dude, I use a pencil. Is what? that weird? <laughs> I use a pencil. <laughs> I honestly haven't used a pencil uh, since high school. I've been pen all the way well, through. Well, my wife's a teacher, so. <laughs> dang it. I should be. My wife's a kindergarten teacher. But um, dang it. Uh, Pilot G205. <laughs> and this is honestly what I do every single week for DFS. This is what I do when I prepare for our show docs. Is I get out a pad of paper and I just write out the matchups. So Miami's playing. Hopefully it's not the Jets that week, but Miami's playing whoever. <laughs> and you're writing out the quarterback, the running backs, the wide receiver, the tight ends, and you're just writing the names just so that you can have them in front of you. A lot of times the people that we like are kind of just floating out there in this ambiguous world. You're going about your week, you're listening to podcasts, you're consuming different stuff. But just to have it in front of you, for me, I need it to be tangible. A lot of people like spreadsheets, that's totally fine. And on the first day of the week, I just write out the schedule and throughout the week, I just circled the guys that I initially like. I know that I have certain biases towards players. So I know I like my Falcons and I need to take off my Falcons hat when I do DFS. I know I need to take off my redraft hat. Like, man, I have this, I have Christian McCaffrey on my redraft team. <laughs> so I need, you know, to be on him every single week. You need to be able to just identify where you're at. And so starting with that is the easiest process. And I think anybody can do that. If you search Twitter long enough, you see lots of algorithms and you see spreadsheets and it can be overwhelming, but just the best place to start is a pen and some paper and just begin to just write down and familiarize yourself with the matchups that week. And then when you get into the DFS pass, we break down every single matchup. We'll have the Vegas lines. We'll have the wide receiver and cornerback matchups for you. Uh, we'll talk about stacks that we like, ownership percentages like there's so many different things that are included in the dfs pass so at the end of the week we do all that work for you we just need every single person to see what the matchups are out there so before we end i want to make sure that you guys know about underdog you can sign up for underdog today and enter the best ball mania for a chance at a million dollar in prizes by going to underdogfantasy.com or searching for underdog fantasy in your app store. And you actually have an article coming out. It's actually going to be out tomorrow. I'm about to edit it uh, about, about a best ball draft recap. So anything you just want to tell the people about playing on underdog and what your experience has been like? So far, it's been awesome. I mean, the if you liked draft last year and previously, you're going to love underdog. It's a lot of the same features. And for me, it's it's been my go to. The app is awesome. They're adding content to it every day. So you can look at like um, your bi week exposure, how many um, shares, so to speak. That's kind of a DFS term, but how many um, leagues, if you're drafting on that app, you have a certain player. So there's lots of cool features. I love it. We're playing there all the time. And we're talking about you and I doing a collaborative article on the site about how to attack their tournaments, their big, like huge payout tournaments, which will be really fun to write. But yeah, check out the the recap article. I put a little bit more strategy advice in it as well as kind of my thoughts when I was drafting my team. But yeah, go check them out, guys. Underdog Fantasy uh, is crushing. Yeah, they have some they have some great tournaments out there. The Bubble Tournament, the Best Ball Mania. It's something you guys need to check out. So thanks for joining us on the Footballers DFS podcast. Look forward to talking to you guys and see you next week. to another edition of the Fantasy Footballers DFS Podcast. Don't forget to visit us on the web at www.thefantasyfootballers.com.